Thank you very much for the introduction. So I'll, I'll begin at the beginning. In October of 1989, I had perfect hearing. But at the end of that year, I had no hearing whatsoever. It began when I could not hear the quiet passages of music on a car radio. That day, turning up the volume helped. But soon, there was no more music. And the voices of friends and of family receded. And I entered a world of silence. The reason for my deafness was a medically necessary dose of utter toxic antibiotics that destroyed the hair cells in my cochlea, which is the organ of hearing. The reason for the antibiotics was that earlier that year, I had contracted acute myelogenous leukemia, a truly terrible form of cancer. But thanks to friends at Syracuse University, at Purdue University, and Cornell University, I received first-rate medical care at the Cornell University Medical School in New York City. An industrial strength dose of chemotherapy beat the cancer, but left me without an immune system. And the antibiotics protected me until my own immune system had returned. For those who could once hear and who suddenly lose all of their hearing, deafness is a truly terrible disability. You can read of many cases of those thus afflicted who become depressed, they withdraw from society, and without an appropriate support network, they can turn to substance abuse and even to suicide. For the majority of our citizens, who lose hearing as they age. Studies show that they leave the workforce years earlier than they otherwise would do, and from thence on lead less fulfilling and productive lives. Children who are born deaf and who are outside the deaf community fare even worse. They're sent to schools with children who can hear, but they lack the ability to develop an oral linguistic system. They leave school at the age of 18 with the reading age of a 12-year-old, and that is a gap too large to close. But fortunately, science and technology are coming to the rescue to treat many forms of deafness. And in this talk, I'm going to describe one of those forms, the cochlear implant. So the outline of the talk, I'll first talk about how we hear. And then, the causes of deafness, more than 10%, 30 million citizens in this country cannot hear well. I'll talk about how hearing can be recovered, concentrating on the cochlear implant. I'll briefly mention some of the political and social issues that surround this somewhat controversial technology, and then talk about the future of the device. So sound is a form of mechanical energy. When we take a tuning fork and strike that tuning fork, the oscillatory motion of the tines of the fork set nearby air molecules into oscillatory motion. And they set more distant air molecules into oscillatory motion. And in this way, a mechanical disturbance passes through the air until it arrives at our ear flap or peanut. And what happens then is truly remarkable. And I'd like to show you what happens by showing you pieces of a video that was created by Brandon Pletch, a young medical illustrationist from Georgia in 2003. The video is called Auditory Transduction. And it received the first place in a national competition for science and engineering visualization that year. And so the sound arrives at our pinot, or ear flap, and that pinot collects the sound and funnels it down onto the ear canal, which is about a centimeter across, until it, it arrives at our tympanic membrane, otherwise known as the eardrum. 
and the air drum vibrates in response to the sound. Now, the air drum is conical in shape, and it is articulated by three small bones collectively called the ossicles. They are the malleus or hammer, the incus or, sta or, or foot plate, uh, sorry, incus or amber, and the stapes or foot plate. And these three bones are the three smallest bones in the human body with the foot plate about the size of a grain of rice. And it's through the ossicles that the vibrations of the tympanic membrane in response to sound are transmitted to the stapes. Now, the stapes moves with a piston-like action at the oval window of the bony labyrinth. The bony labyrinth is several centimeters across, and it is filled with a cerebral spinal-like fluid that's shown here in purple. Now, fluid is relatively incompressible, and so the stapes would not be able to move in a piston-like way if it was not possible to preserve the volume of the fluid. And so the way that's affected is by having a flexible membrane called the round window, shown here. And the fluid volume is preserved by the motion of the stapes in as that membrane comes out. And in this way, the vibrations of the stapes can enter the bony labyrinth, and so all of the energy can get into the bony labyrinth. And the bony labyrinth itself consists of two parts. On the left, the semicircular canals are organ of balance. And on the right, in green, the snail-shaped cochlea. Cochlea is a Latin word for a snail. So vibrations from the stapes are drawn into the helical structure. They arise to its apex and then descend to the round window. In more detail, we can see that this cochlea consists of two principal ducts. They're called scalae. They're each about a millimeter across and the vibrations arise in the scala vestibuli and descend in the scala tympani. Now, these two ducts are full of a potassium-rich, uh, sodium-rich solution, but there's a third duct, which is only about 0.3, one-third of a millimeter across, and that's sort of a potassium-rich solution. It's called the cochlear duct. And the whole of this structure, the cochlea, is absolutely tiny. It's about the size of a pea. And because it's so small, it's not very heavy, and that's very important. Because it's not small, it's easy for very soft sounds to cause it to be excited, to vibrate it. And that means that we can hear soft sound because our cochlea is small. And one more thing, this is a real cochlea in a human being at five months gestation. It's been taken out of the bony labyrinth. At birth, the cochlea is fully formed and fully functional. So if we increase the magnification further, we can see that the two ducts of the cochlea, the major ones, are separated from the cochlear duct by membranes, the rhizonal membrane and the basilar membrane. And these two membranes are flexible. And so where the energy from the stapes causes vibrations to pass through the fluid, the two membranes flex and respond to those vibrations. And on the lower of these membranes, the basilar membrane, there's a specialized organ called the organ of Corti, and that's shown here in green. And when this organ is stimulated, it produces electricity that passes to the brain along the auditory nerve, and the auditory nerve shown here fills the hollow modiolus of the cochlea and innervates it upon its entire 35 millimeter helical length. So it's a 35 millimeter spiral, all in contained in the size of a pea. It's an incredibly delicate instrument, and very small. Now, the origin of these electrical signals are specialized cells called hair cells. On the left, inner hair cells, and on the right, outer hair cells, both shown in green. And the hair cells are on the basilar membrane, and they're closely covered by a second membrane called the tectorial membrane, and that's gelatinous. And when the basilar membrane vibrates in response to sound, cilia, Latin word for hairs, above the hair cell, bend. And when they bend, they trigger the cells, causing them to fire, producing the electricity, and we hear sound. And so the mechanical motion of the air molecules ends up turning into electrical signals. So we call the hair cells 
mechanoelectrical transducers, and in, in your ear now, if you have good hearing, you have 3,500 inner hair cells and 12,500 outer hair cells in each cochlea. That's a lot of hair cells. Now, the basilar membrane itself does not respond simultaneously to the presence of sound. Instead, it responds variably, depending on the frequency, the pitch. So low-frequency sounds cause the basilar membrane to vibrate at its apex, and high-frequency sounds cause the basilar membrane to vibrate at its base. And so the basilar membrane itself is a frequency analyzer. It's how we know if a sound is high or low. And so that is called tonotopic organization. And it won the Nobel Prize in 1961 for a physicist called George von Bekerger from Hungary. And this is a result of his work. What these numbers are, are the frequency or pitch of the sound. And when a very high frequency sound of 20,000 cycles a second is presented to your ear, it's the base of the basilar membrane, which is very small and very stiff, that shakes and vibrates. And when the sound is very low frequency, which is where the basilar membrane is wide and heavy, the frequency that it vibrates at is very low, about 200 or 100 hertz. And now for reference, middle C on the piano is 256 hertz. And so that's just to the right of the number 200. But we can hear sounds much higher than middle C. Now this was a picture that we had of hearing by 1960s or so, but there were some mysteries about the hearing. Because when you think about this basilar membrane vibrating, it's doing so in a fluid, and the fluid should make it hard for the basilar membrane to vibrate. Now, if a sound is very loud, the basilar membrane will vibrate a lot, so we should hear the sound. But if the basilar membrane is uh, vibrating very little because the sound is very soft, we could make calculations that would show it would be very difficult to hear the sound at all, and yet we could still hear and so there were some mysteries. People said there must be some amplifier somewhere in there that would help to make the soft sounds audible. And so in more recent years, that amplifier was found. These are images taken in the 1980s using a modern electron microscope that show the hair cells on the basilar membrane of a mammal. And this is one particular hair cell. It's 30 microns long. That's an inner hair cell. Now a human hair on your head is about 25 microns. So this cell is no longer than a human hair on your head is wide. So it's a really tiny thing. And there were 3,500 of these, and they have signals going to the brain, all of them. But the 12,500 outer hair cells have very few signals going to the brain. They mainly have signals that go from the brain back to the outer hair cells, in fact. And so it wasn't clear what these outer hair cells were for. But what we also learned was that the outer hair cells on top of them have the really tiny structures. The actual hairs are only 500 nanometers across. That's 1 20th the thickness of a human hair. And each of the hair cells has about 40 of these tiny hairs. And even more remarkably, the hairs themselves are joined by tiny fibers. And each fiber is only about 20 times wider than an atom. And when the basilar membrane vibrates in response to sound, and these hair cells get bent and deflected, what these tiny fibers called tip links do is they open trapdoors in the walls of the cell, and that cochlear duct in which the cells are sitting is full of a potassium-rich solution rep represented by the letter for uh, calcium, uh, for potassium, which is a K. And what happens when those trapdoors are open is all those potassium ions flood into the cell. And the cell is like a battery with a positive and a negative side. And suddenly, when all of this electric current flows into the cell, it causes a reaction in the cell. The cell depolarizes, and through a sequence of very complex chemical steps, neurotransmitters are released at the base of the cell, and we hear sound. And all the hair cells work in this way. So then the question becomes, where is this amplifier? What, and could it be the outer hair cells? So we know the inner hair cells are sending signals to the brain and we hear the sound. What are these outer hair cells doing? So here's an outer hair cell. This outer hair cell 
is about 80 microns long, so about three times the thickness of a human hair. And we've taken out one of them and put it in a Petri dish and keep it alive. And now we're going to take some music and play it to a microphone. The microphone turns the music into electricity, and the electricity will pass on this electrode to the microphone. And when we do so, the electric current will be modulated by the volume of the music and the tempo of the music. So we're going to turn on the movie and watch what happens now as the music starts to play. One, two, three o'clock, four o'clock, rock. Five, six, seven o'clock, eight o'clock, rock. Nine, ten, eleven o'clock, twelve o'clock, rock, you're gonna rock. So the first thing to remember is this, that's what happens in your ear. And you've got 12,500 of these hair cells in each of your ears, so next time you dance to the music, it's not just you that's dancing, it's 25,000 hair cells in your healthy cochlea. <laughs> and, okay, so now, what, what, what does this all mean, though? This thing is changing. It's changing by just a couple of microns when that current flows in. And what that current from that electrode represents is that potassium current when the trap door opens on the last slide. And so what we're saying is the current comes in and the hair cell contracts, just like a spring. And so what we believe happens is the following. In the top cartoon on the right, you've got the inner hair cells on the left, and then you've got three rows of outer hair cells on the right. The basilar membrane at the bottom of the picture is vibrating in response to sound. If that sound is large, the, the motion of the basilar membrane is large, and all those hair cells get bent, and the inner hair cells produce electricity, and we hear the sound. It's a loud sound. But supposing that the sound is really soft, and the basilar membrane is barely moving, and so there's a danger that those inner hair cells here won't be deflected, and they won't produce electricity, and we won't hear sound, unless these outer hair cells, when the current comes into them, contracting length, like you saw in the movie. And when they're contracting length, they pull on the basilar membrane, increasing the deflection. And in that way, even the softest sounds will cause the inner hair cells to be triggered and fire and we hear sound. And that's what the outer hair cells are doing. The outer hair cells are mechanical amplifiers that contract during transduction, enhancing basilar membrane displacement, increasing the sensitivity to soft sound. And also, they improve our pitch perception as well. And if you want to know how that works, you can ask a question at the end. But that, so that's the incredibly complex and remarkable way in which we hear. And so, from the motion of air molecules to the collection of all those vibrations and motions of those air molecules by your ear flap, the channeling of that motion down onto your ear canal, which then arrives at the eardrum, the eardrum vibrates, it causes three bones to move, the last of those pushes against the bony labyrinth, and that displaces fluid in the bony labyrinth. Then the basilar membrane vibrates because of that fluid moving. The hair cells start to bend in response to the motion of the basilar membrane, and electricity is produced at the base of the hair cells, and it passes to the brain. It's that sequence of events that gives rise to our auditory perception of the world around us. So that is how natural hearing works. And the task now is to try to bring back that process in some way, artificially. So to understand how we do that, we first have to understand why it is that some people cannot hear. And so there's five main reasons why hearing is lost or not present at birth. One is genetic. The second is infections, for example, meningitis or rubella. The third is if you're exposed to extremely loud sounds, because extremely loud sounds produce large motion of the basilar membrane, cause a large flexion of the hair cells and can physically break them in some cases. The fourth is certain drugs, for example, certain antibiotics like the ones I had in 1989, and certain chemotherapeutic agents as well. And what these do is destroy the integrity of the hair cell. 
so that it essentially dissolves and no longer functions. And the fifth is simply old age. It affects about 10% of all of our citizens, not the old age, that affects everyone, but the effect, a byproduct, the hearing loss, affects about 10% of our citizens. And 30 million people in the US cannot hear. So now, that's the reasons why we have no hearing. You classify it into two forms of hearing loss. The first one is called conductive hearing loss, and that is simply that the ossicles, the little bones between the eardrum and the bony labyrinth, are not functioning. They could be broken in some way. And to solve that problem, surgery can be used and can be very successful at restoring hearing. But that's actually the more rare form of hearing loss. The more common one is so-called sensory neural hearing loss, sometimes called nerve deafness, although it's not nerve deafness at all. It's actually that your hair cells aren't working. Remember, the hair cells are producing electricity that passes to the brain. If they're not working, you're not going to hear. Now, normally, the type of deafness that people experience as they age, for example, is due to the loss of some hair cells. And when you lose a few hair cells, a bit of your hearing goes, so you have a mild or moderate hearing loss. And under those circumstances, a hearing aid, which makes sounds louder, is the way to recover your hearing. And so when you lose some hair cells, that means there's less hair cells turning mechanical energy into electricity. And so the hearing aid makes up for that by producing much louder sounds in your ear, and that causes the ossicles to move much more vigorously, displacing much more fluid and causing much more vibration. And so that compensates for the fact you have less hair cells to turn that sound into electricity. And hearing aids are very, very effective and bring back hearing for the vast majority of people that have hearing loss that's mild or moderate. However, in about 4% of all cases, the amount of hair cell loss is really large. And when that happens, a hearing aid will not help because it doesn't matter how much louder the sound becomes. There's no process in your ear anymore to turn that sound into electricity. So we don't hear. And it's for people in that situation, about 4% of people that have hearing loss, for which a cochlear implant can in some cases help. Now, cochlear implants are not a new idea. In fact, this guy here, if you, if you, were, if you were already a physicist or a scientist, you, know who, you would know who this guy is. This guy is Volta. And Volta, famous Italian uh, chemist and physicist, his name, uh, he's so famous that his name was given for the electrical unit of the volt because he invented the battery. And this guy, I mean, when you invent something, you want to try it out. And so Volta wanted to try out his battery. And so back in 1800, he did the following. Volta placed two metallic probes in both ears and connected the ends of the two probes to a 50-volt battery. <laughs> this is a true story. And this is what he wrote. Now, he wrote it in Italian, and this is translated into English, OK? But this is what he wrote verbatim. At the moment when the circuit was completed, I received a shock in the head. And some moments after, I began to hear a sound, or rather a noise in the ears, which I cannot well define. It was a kind of a crackling with shocks, as if some paste or tenacious matter had been boiling. Now, notice how beautifully they wrote in 1800. But he went on to say, the disagreeable sensation, which I believe might be dangerous because of the shock to the brain, prevented me from repeating the experiment. <laughs> So that was a true story. So that's 1800. That was the first cochlear implant. Right. Now, about 180 years later, in about 1980, we got to the modern cochlear implant. And so now, a cochlear implant is not a hearing aid. Unlike a hearing aid, which makes sounds louder, a cochlear implant does not make sounds louder at all. What a cochlear implant does is it bypasses the non-functional hair cells and sends electrical signals directly to the brain. And so it makes up for the fact that you don't have hair cells. And this is a cochlear implant in a, in a cartoon here. And it has a number of parts. The cochlear implant is a big misnomer because 
An awful lot of the cochlear implant is not implanted, it's actually outside. And so you can see here number one, number two and number three are all outside and I'm wearing them right now here on my ear. And I can, I can I take this off for you to see. But when I take it off, I won't hear anything, okay? So I won't keep it up for very long. But anyway, this, this, is, the this is the cochlear implant. And all of this is outside my head, even though it's called the cochlear implant, right? Now, notice the similarity between that cartoon and this, okay? So the microphone is right at the front of the cochlear implant. This piece is an application-specific integrated circuit. It's basically a silicon chip. So it's the equivalent of what you have in a computer, except it doesn't have an operating system. This thing is the battery pack that powers the cochlear implant, and this thing is an antenna. It's an antenna that will send radio waves. So that's the exterior part of the implant. So now I'll say those same things on the slide. So sounds are picked up by a microphone, and that's just the same as in a hearing aid, the microphone, the first piece. And then they're turned into electrical signal because that's what a microphone does. So that's just like in a hearing aid. The second bit is that that signal, that electrical signal, is then passed to that application-specific integrated circuit, the silicon chip. And what that integrated circuit is going to do, it's going to look at the sound, the electrical signal, and it's going to see what frequencies are present and how loud those sounds are. And it's going to digitize all of that information. And then what happens is these digital pulses are going to be sent to the coil antenna, that's number three in that picture. And in the drawing, that coil antenna is just above the rest of the implant. In my case, it's on the other ear. And if you want to know why that is, you can ask me at the end. But it works the same way. And what that antenna is going to do is it's going to transmit radio waves. And the radio waves are going to contain on them all of the ones and zeros, all the digital information about the sound. And they're going to pass through the skin and into the mastoid bone. And in the mastoid bone, there's a second application-specific integrated circuit, another silicon chip, and it does the opposite of the first one. It reads the radio, radio wave and all of the ones and zeros sitting on that radio wave, and they tell the device how loud the sound was and what frequencies were present and it turns it back into analog information and sends it on an electrode. And that electrode is that red line in the picture running from the implant down to the cochlea and the spiral shape is the cochlea itself. And then the auditory nerve is that piece in yellow, number five, and that picks up the electrical pulses from the cochlear implant. And then the brain, number six, recognizes the signals of sound. And I should say that in this picture, the brain is not to scale. <laughs> so here's a, here's a drawing. This drawing, actually, is a really old drawing of a cochlear implant. It doesn't look much like the one you saw on the last slide. And that's because, although the microphone is the same, the speech processor, in this case, is quite big. And that's because in the 1980s and early 1990s, all of the electronics that today is in this little chip was in a big thing about that big. And this drawing comes from an old book. In any case, there's a microphone, a speech processor, and then there's a transmitter, and then there's a skin, and then a receiver, and then an electrical array of the cochlea. And you'll remember that earlier I said that in natural hearing, the high-frequency sound stimulates the cochlea, uh, and the auditory nerve at its base, and the low-frequency sound at the top. And that's a very important fact. And the cochlear implant takes advantage of that. It, what it does, it exploits the natural arrangement of our cochlear and our auditory nerve by having a number of electrodes that varies depending on the manufacturer, somewhere between 10 and 22 electrodes spread along the cochlear. And what happens is the speech processor is continuously measuring and sorting the sounds and the signals by pitch and loudness. And then the high-frequency sounds that it detects are sent to electrodes at the cochlear base, which is where in our natural hearing 
we would respond to high frequency sound. And the low frequency sounds are sent to electrodes at the cochlear apex, which is where in our natural physiology we would respond to high frequency sounds. And it's that key idea that makes the cochlear implant an effective transmitter of the spoken word. If you don't do that, the cochlear implant does not work well. And so this is a modern multi-channel cochlear implant shown in the scalar tympani of the cochlear within light green, the auditory nerve. And each of these rectangles is an electrode, and every time it flashes white, that's a pulse of electricity corresponding to a certain frequency of sound. And in my device, the one I'm wearing now, there are 18,800 of these pulses every second going to the auditory nerve. Now, this is a graph of sentence recognition, which means speech perception from 0 to 100. And in this axis is time and type of cochlear implant. And in 1980, they were the first commercial cochlear implant. It was one electrode. And so that was a lot like what Volta had, one electrode going in, and you heard some paced or tenacious matter boiling. In other words, you could perceive sound but you could not comprehend language in 1980. But by the mid-1990s, the idea of exploiting the arrangement of the auditory nerve with low and high frequencies and how that's done in natural physiology was exploited to have multiple electrodes in the cochlear implant. And as that was done, so the ability of a patient to comprehend speech went up. And so by 1996 or so, about 80% of sentences that were read to a cochlear implantee could be understood if they were fortunate enough to have a multi-electrode cochlear implant. And my device is a modern version of this one here in 1996. What I'm wearing today is the 2012 model, in fact. So, in my case, I hadn't got a cochlear implant. And the reason I hadn't got one after I became deaf and spent 12 years without hearing was because I'd been told that cochlear implants, the chances that they would work are not very high and that the variability is very large, patient to patient. But I was also aware that these devices were getting better every year. And then in 2001, I was um, talking to a friend of mine and he suddenly told me that his brother-in-law had a cochlear implant and that this had totally changed his life. And it was for that reason that I decided to learn more about how I could get one. And so, who can have a cochlear implant? Now, these requirements of the United States, they vary slightly from country to country, but they're very similar everywhere. And so, the requirements are first for adults, so children will be discussed separately. For adult here, I mean 18 years of age or older, but there's no limitation by age. You can be 90 years of age and get a cochlear implant and learn to hear with it. So you need to be bilaterally, moderately to profoundly sensory neural hearing loss, deaf. In other words, your hair cells don't work. And you need to get no benefit from state-of-the-art hearing aids in an extended trial. And about a million citizens in the United States qualify. And today there's close to 100,000 cochlear implantees in the United States, with a significant fraction of those being children. Now, you need to be psychologically suitable. And at the time I was being interviewed for the cochlear implant, they said to me, and I was lip reading at the time, they said to me, no psychotics. And I thought they said, no physicists. <laughs> and you need to have no anatomic or medical contraindication. And then you can have a cochlear implant in principle if you meet the requirements. So then what happens next is you have lots of audiological tests, and you have medical tests, CT scan, and MRI, and then you get to choose what type of device you would like implanted inside of you. There are three main manufacturers, an Australian company, an Austrian company, and a US company. All the devices, no matter, although each of these manufacturers will tell you that their device perhaps has slight advantages over the other two, most people in the field tell me that all the devices have rather similar performance, and the biggest variable in each case in the outcome is the patient themselves. And so then you have to wait for surgery, and that can be many months. 
And then finally, the surgery day arrives, and it's a major surgery, two to four hours under general anesthesia. And here is a cochleostomy. That's the opening at the scarlet tympani to place the electrode. The electrode is going here into the scarlet tympani. And then a postage stamp recess is carved in the mastoid bone to hold a receiver stimulator and a magnet. Unfortunately, the complication rate is very rare, less than 5%. The most common problems are wound infection and breakdown, and that usually resolves itself. There's a tiny risk of a facial nerve injury because the cochleostomy is performed about a millimeter from the facial nerve. And if the facial nerve is transected during the operation, it will not regenerate. And that would lead to permanent facial paralysis, which is a tragedy for the patient and also for the surgeon. There's a possibility of vertigo because the bony labyrinth also holds an organ of balance. That also usually resolves. And there's also the possibility of a basic hardware malfunction. When that happens, you can re-implant, and that's usually successful. From now on, you have to avoid MRI because you have a magnet in your head. The purpose of the magnet is to hold the receiver stimulator into close proximity to the transmitter on the outside of your head. And that's how this stays on with a magnet. And then you have to wait eight weeks after this surgery for the wound to heal before the device can be activated and hopefully you can hear again. And during that eight weeks, you wonder how to pay the medical bill. <laughs> so the cost. So th this applies to the US, and I was implanted in the US. The cost is about between sixteen and hundred thousand dollars, including the evaluation, the surgery, the post-operative hospital care, and the extensive audiological rehabilitation that many people require. Medicare and Medicaid pay total or partial cost. Some private insurers refuse to cover the device. Others provide excellent coverage. This is a quote. The reimbursement levels have forced eight hospitals to close CI programs due to the cost of subsidizing the implants. Other hospitals ration services by putting children on waiting lists. There's currently 45,000 US children that are CI eligible. At the end of 2010, about half of them, just over half of them, had a cochlear implant. Only 7% of CI eligible adults have a cochlear implant. And yet, you know, the cost of this implant is small compared to the cost in government aid and education and training estimated at more than a million dollars for the course of a human lifetime. And that doesn't even begin to take into account the massive human cost of going through life deaf in a hearing world. Another quote, ultimately this is about the way society views hearing. Being deaf is not going to kill you, and so the insurance companies do not view this as necessary. Now, I was one of the lucky ones in that the cost of my implant was fully covered by my employer. <coughs> so finally, um, the day arrives about eight weeks after the surgery when you actually have the device turned on for the first time. And in my case, the surgery was at the Roddy Hospital for Children in Indianapolis in um, November 2002. And we were hoping to go back to Europe to see my family uh, uh, for the holidays and that we hadn't told them about the implant, and the idea would be that they'd have a pleasant surprise and find that I could hear again. But unfortunately, the activation date was set for January, so we were very disappointed. But then, four days before we were leaving to fly to Europe, my wife had a phone call from the hospital, and they said, there's been a cancellation, can Ian drive down the next day to uh, get activated? And so, of course, the answer was, you bet. So the next day, I drive down from Peru, where I was working at the time, to Indianapolis, and it's about an hour drive, and normally that drive goes like that. But on this occasion, it took a lot longer than normal. And that's because you're wondering the whole time whether you're going to get your hearing back at the end of this drive. So you get to the hospital, you walk into a very, very high-tech audiology uh, <coughs> clinic, and you're hooked up, your implant is hooked up to a laptop. It's a PC. And I say that advisedly, a PC, because this is not Mac compatible, it crashes the Mac. And what happens next is that all of the different settings, parameters, to operate the device are downloaded from the PC into here. And during that period, which takes about an hour, you hear nothing. And at the end of that time, you're becoming very tense and nervous, and the audiologist turned to me and she said, in a few minutes now, we're going to turn on this device. But please understand that when this device turns on, because you've been deaf for 12 years, you may hear absolutely nothing. 
If you're lucky, you'll hear some soft sounds, and if you're really, really lucky, you might actually be able to understand what I'm going to say to you when the device is turned off. So she then went back to her PC and continued to work, and after a few more minutes, I was really impatient, and I said to her, have you turned this device on yet? And before I'd got to the end of that sentence, I realized I'd heard my own voice through my own ears for the first time in 12 years. That was really pretty exciting. But then, that evening, I got to drive back from Indianapolis to Bordeaux, and I got to hear my wife's voice for the first time in 12 years. And because my daughter was born shortly after I became deaf, I got to hear my daughter's voice for the very first time. And there are no words in the English language to describe how wonderful that is. But that's the power of a cochlear implant, to restore your humanity, to put you back in touch with the world. So how well, then, does my cochlear implant actually work? So many of you have had an audiogram in your lives. So this is a graph. And on the y-axis, the vertical axis, soft sounds are at the top and loud sounds are at the bottom. And on this axis, low-frequency sounds are on the left and high-frequency sounds are on the right. And those green circles there are what normal hearing looks like on a graph like that. So normal hearing people can hear very soft sounds at any frequency. This was my hearing, the, the pink circles, before the cochlear implant. And what that means is that if you stand on a runway, you can just about hear a jumbo jet take off. So that's how deaf I was. Six months after the cochlear implant was turned on, I was performing as those white circles there. And so you can see it's not as good as normal hearing, but it was pretty close. A dramatic improvement. Now, on the right are my speech test scores. The column with all those zeros in it was my test scores before the operation. So it's kind of embarrassing to be a physics professor and get 0% on a test. <laughs> However, after the operation, six months later, you'll see scores that were 0% had become, in some cases, very high indeed. And that's because of the cochlear implant, enabling me to understand speech again. And the scores I was getting back in 2003 were regarded as very good. But today, they're regarded as not exceptional. 75% of recent post-lingually deaf patients with state-of-the-art cochlear implants can use the telephone. So that means that you're not seeing the lips move, you're not reading lips, you're relying entirely on the auditory information through a telephone. Now, the question then becomes, how is this all possible? You've seen the incredible beauty and, and sophistication of natural hearing, and we've replaced it, we've replaced 3,500 inner hair cells with some number of electrodes that varies depending on the manufacturer between about 8 and 20. So how can it be that we can hear with such a crude device? So the reason that the cochlear implant works is because hearing is not only about what you put into the cochlea, it's about what the brain makes of that information. And so perception, whether it's visual or auditory, is actually a combination of two things. It's top-down processing, it's what your brain makes of that information, and bottom-up processing, which means what's coming in from outside. And the two together give rise to our perception. And so, the amount of detail that you need depends on how distinctive the object is that you're looking at or listening to, and the level of familiarity that you already have with that object. So to give you an example, if you see a huge grey animal in the distance, you don't need much detail to know that it's an elephant, because there's only one big, huge grey animal. So I want to give you some examples of this first visual example. I want to show you an image, and it's an image that you're very familiar with. There won't be much detail in the image, it's a very poor quality image. But because you know who this person is already, You'll be able to tell me who it is, relying on your top-down information. You're not relying very much on the bottom-up information, the quality of the image itself. So who is this person? Do you know? Does anyone know? American. What? Lincoln. Yeah, that's right. It's Lincoln. Roach, Roach. So I'm going to add more information for those of you that don't yet spot Lincoln. Here's a bit more information. And a bit more. And a bit more, you see? Oh. Lincoln. Lincoln. 
Now, that was the people that spotted Lincoln right off. was because they've either seen this kind of thing on the web already, but that's fine, or they just recognized Lincoln already. But either way, it was top-down information. It was knowledge about the world that you live in. And if you doubt that you use top-down process, and I can tell you that although Lincoln is quite well known in the United Kingdom, where I grew up, he's not as well known as he is here. And so if this was a UK audience, they wouldn't have got it with the first image. It would have taken longer. So the language equivalent of that would be a missing word in a well-known phrase. For example, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United of America. I didn't say the word states, but you all know that the word states is the word that was missing. And you did that from top-down processing. And that's how a post-lingually deaf person with a cochlear implant understands speech. I do not understand every word. I understand some of the words, and I understand the context, and I fill in the gaps. But now, let's remove our ability to use top-down processing. I want to show you an image that you've all seen before, but it's not an image you're very familiar with, because you've only seen it perhaps a couple of times in your life. And so, although you've all seen it before, when I show it to you now, with limited information, you probably won't recognize what it is, because you're relying on bottom-up information only, and that bottom-up information is not very good. OK, so what is this? Does anybody know? Yes, what is it? What? The Mona Lisa. The Mona Lisa. Oh, wait, you're pretty close, actually. You know, you're the first person. I've given this talk a few times now. And you're the first person who's even been brave enough to guess at this point. And actually, that's a pretty good guess. But no, it's not the Mona Lisa, but that was a really good guess. You deserve a prize. That's really good. OK, I'm going to add a bit more information. Tell me if you know what it is now. I'm going to add more information. Anyone know? See, it's not very distinctive. That's why you don't know. So you've got to guess. Somebody's got to guess. What about now? Nobody's guessing still. So this kid at the front is really brave. He said Mona Lisa, and you were close. You want to make another guess? Oh, you're really close, sir. I know, you. I know you're going to get it in a second. Here we go. Watch. You watch. It's going to come into view. Now, there's a guess at the back. The creation of Adam? The what? The creation of Adam? No, but you're close. Watch. Yeah, so this is the disintegration of the persistence of memory by Dali. And you have all seen that before. But this time, because I've removed your ability to use top-down processing, you had to rely on the quality of the information coming in. So the language equivalent of that is a missing word in a phrase you've never heard before, or a phrase in a language you don't know, or language heard for the very first time through a cochlear implant, which is exactly this situation a prelingually deaf child is in when they're given a cochlear implant. So for an adult like me, when I got my cochlear implant, the, pro the challenge I had was to recognize Abe Lincoln. But for a child born deaf, if you give them a cochlear implant, they've got to recognize this Dali. That's a lot harder. Much, much harder problem. So now the question becomes, can a cochlear implant give you enough information to recognize that that image was Dali? And so this is a photograph of a word. And the word is choice. And the top picture is a graph of frequency on the left axis and time running from left to right. And it's color-coded, where white means loud. And so you can actually see the three syllables of choice. The first piece on the left is ch, and that middle piece is oi, which is the loudest part of the sound, and then the top piece on the right is the s at the end. So choice, three pieces. Can you see that? Now, the image underneath it's exactly the same word, except now it's not frequency versus time. It's what a cochlear implant would see. And so there's ch, oi, and s. So you can agree that there's some similarity, right? But they're not identical. And the question is, is that good enough to recognize the word choice? How can we make it good enough? So that's been a big challenge in cochlear implant research for the last 20 years or so. And so how do you optimize a cochlear implant to maximize speech recognition? So you first have to decide what are the features that you actually 
what are the features of the pattern of neural output from a cochlea that then goes to the auditory nerve that are important? And there's three things you could think about getting right. One is amplitude, the loudness. But actually, that doesn't matter very much. And the reason is because as long as I am audible to you, it does not matter whether I speak slightly louder or slightly softer. You'll still understand me. And so faithfully rendering amplitude is not that important. The second one is the time structure of sound. You know, what bits come first, what bits come later. And it turns out that's not very important either. And the reason for that is the same reason that when you watch a movie, you're unaware of the fact that the movie is actually a sequence of still pictures. And the reason why you're unaware is because the frequency with which those pictures change is just the right, so your brain doesn't notice it. The same thing is true for hearing. As long as you present the sound to the brain very rapidly, the brain doesn't notice the pulsing of the cochlear implant. And so neither of these things matter very much. What does matter is the place along the auditory nerve that you stimulate and the number of places that you do that. And so that correlates with the frequency of the sound and the number of electrodes that you have. And so I want to show you that by letting you hear what it's like to hear with a cochlear implant. And so what we're going to do first is play a sentence in English to you. But this sentence is going to be as you would hear it if you had a single electrode cochlear implant. Here, one channel means a single electrode. And so all the sound of this sentence in English is going to be concentrated on one electrode at one place in the cochlea. And that's exactly the kind of thing that Volta had in 1800 and that the 3M Corporation made in 1980. So tell me what this sentence is. So what was that? Anyone know? Now, you, you at the front, right? You guessed Mona Lisa. You probably know what this is, right? No? OK. So now we're going to go to two channels. So two channels means two electrodes, two places of stimulation. So we're going to take all of the lower frequency sounds, all of them, and put them in one electrode, and all the other sounds, which are higher, and put them in the other electrode. And so what will happen then is you'll get a different sound to when you had a single electrode, but it might still be quite hard to understand. So tell me what this is. It's the same sentence. So the sound, it changed, right? It sounded different to you, but it's still difficult to recognize. So now let's go to four channels, so four electrodes. One for low, one for high, and two for intermediate frequencies of sound. Anyone know? Happy what? Happy no, but you're close, you're close. So at four channels, people start to feel that it's beginning to be intelligible. Now, I'm going to play eight channels. And uh, before I play eight channels, let me tell you that I have eight channels. So this time you'll hear what I hear. And I think some of you, a few of you will understand what this is, but not everyone, probably. Try this. OK, what is it? Anyone want to guess? At the back. I like to play chess. Yeah, no, close. You're very close. OK, so now you're very, very close. Almost as close as the guess with the Mona Lisa, actually closer. So, OK, now, now I'm going to play you the original. Did you play it again? Yeah, no, 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 no. <laughs> I need to play it again. Not yet, not yet. I mean, after all, if you're, if you're really deaf, and, 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 and you, so you went a cochlear implant, and now you say, oh, play it again, the train may have left the station. <laughs> so you can't do that. No, no. Uh, first, we're going to play the original. And then we're going to play it again. OK, and then you'll see. And then, and then you'll really get the sense. So, so, OK, so now the original. And now, of course, this time everyone will understand it. To play tennis. Did you hear it? I like to play tennis. I like to play tennis, right? Now, OK, so now you know what it is. So now let's play, to satisfy that guy at the back there called Hubert, <laughs> they're going to play eight channels again. Now, remember, nobody in this room except one person got even close. The person at the back was really close, actually. Chess, tennis, it's pretty close. But... It was, it was pretty close now. But now listen again. And the point is the following, that this time when you hear it, you, have, you know what it is, right? So you've got top-down processing. 
And so you're going to use your top-down process. You have no choice in this. It's completely involuntary like breathing. You're going to use your top-down processing when you hear this, and this time it will be perfectly intelligible to you, despite the fact that it was not intelligible last time. So now everyone will understand it. To play tax. Yeah, then play right. Let's try again. I like to play tax. You see? So that's the power of the top-down processing coming into play and making it intelligible. Now, although I have eight channels, and you have the original, most of you in this room, if you have good hearing, you shouldn't think that what, what I hear is that nasty mechanical sound. And the reason for that is because of the top-down processing, and I can remember how voices sounded before I was deaf, I put my memory of, of voice on top of what I hear, and so I hear a beautiful sound just like the original. Okay, now, what this is a graph of is people with cochlear implants. And this is the number of implant channels that they had, and they all had multiple channel devices. And what we do is we turn them all off, and we ask, can you understand? This is perception. And when there's only one channel, they can't understand anything. And as we gradually turn on channels, so they can understand everything. And when you get to about eight channels, that's when it plateaus. So if you add more, it doesn't get much better after that. And that's exactly what you just experienced. And it's the most important factor of a speech recognition, the number of channels of information. Is there a question? But if you had 20 instead of 8, do you learn to understand it more quickly? It's, no, not really. Not as far as we can tell. 20 and 8 tend to be about the same. Now, if you could make 10,000, then that would be different. That would be like normal hearing. But the difference between 8 and 20 is not very large, and people haven't noticed much difference. There's many other variables that are much bigger than the number of channels, and that's the reason. Yeah. I mean, if the same person had 8, and then you could add an extra... 14 or 12, that would make some difference to that person. But person, to, when you vary it over a class of people, then you don't see that benefit. What is the effect of the transformer they use, whether they use a, a wavelet transform or a Fourier transform to go from the original signal uh, in the time domain to the frequency domain and then transform it back to the frequency? Yeah, but we'll get, let me get to that. Let, let me get to that when we come to the questions at the end. Okay. Yeah. So what I want to show you next is that even though you have your eight channels or whatever you have and they're turned on, it takes time to learn how to use this device. So it takes time to recognize that fuzzy image of Lincoln as Lincoln. And so this is a graph showing perception versus time preoperatively and after the, the implant has occurred in 39 patients. And you can see that their ability to understand speech improves over the course of the first six months and then doesn't really improve after that. And so this is a demonstration that the adult brain is very plastic. It used to be thought, back when this study was done, it used to be thought that only children had plastic brains, but adults do too. But all the adults in this study were postlingually deaf, so they had the advantage of being able to use their top-down processing, to learn how to use their device, and they could use their memory of language. But what about prelingually deaf children? How would they fare? And so this is where the device has historically uh, involved a great deal of controversy. And so the deaf community and cochlear implants. So many of you may know someone who's in the deaf community, and you'll know that people can lead extremely rich and satisfying lives without emphasizing speech when they're part of the deaf community. Learning to read is important, but learning speech is less so for those people in that community. And in the 1990s, when cochlear implants were first coming in, there was a lot of opposition to pediatric implantation in the deaf community well, there was a general neutrality towards adult implantation being recognized as a personal choice. So she would like to now change the tape, so I should stop for a second. Interesting question. So, so it turns out that the, the cochlear itself is full size at birth. Even though, if you look at a baby's head, if you look at a baby, babies are tiny, but their heads are disproportionately large for their bodies. They're not full size. But the actual, um, the actual cochlea is full size. So when you put the electrode in, that can stay. However, because the, the head itself continues to grow a bit, 
you have to make some allowance for the fact that with time, the mastoid bone where the receiver's stimulator is and the, uh, where the cochlear is change relative position, and so you put in a bit of slack in the electrode is one way to deal with that. Okay. That's a really good question. So can we start again? Okay. Right, so, so that's where we are. So there was a neutrality towards adult implantation. Now, the idea was that an implant, if you implant a young child, that will delay their acquisition of sign language, which is their natural language in the deaf community, and also, therefore, their assimilation into the deaf community, which is a real concern. So in 1991, the position statement of the National Association of the Deaf was that they deplore the FDA decision to approve pediatric implantation as being unsound scientifically, procedurally, and ethically. But today, the deaf community tend to regard cochlear implantation both in adults and children as a person of choice. Already in 2000, the National Association of the Deaf said that they emphasized taking advantage of the technological advances that have the potential to improve the quality of life for deaf and hard of hearing persons. And they strongly support the development of the whole child and of language and literacy. So this was a big change. And the reason was because, in some cases, the cochlear implant had been efficacious in young children. Not in all, but in some. And so this is one of the most widely cited studies that shows that. And so on the left is a graph of language age on this axis versus natural age on the horizontal axis. And so a hearing child at age 48 months will have a language age of 48 months, and so on. And so hearing children are the black diagonal solid line. The open and closed circles here are children that were born deaf. And so for a given natural age, their language age is less than their natural age. Now, the closed circles in this graph are children that will be implanted, and the open circles are children that will not be implanted. And the dashed line is the trend, the fit to the data. And on the right are the results, the average results of the 23 children that were implanted, so the first black circle there is before the implantation, and the three that follow it are as the children begin to acquire language skills with the cochlear implant. And so the language age is increasing. Now the white open circles are the prediction of how those children would have performed if they had not been implanted. And so what we see from this is that the children that are implanted are advancing their language age more quickly than the children that haven't been implanted, and in fact, are acquiring language at almost the same rate as hearing children. They're just starting off from a lower base. And so this is a truly remarkable result. But to quote the paper, there's a large amount of individual variability. But the best performers in the implanted group seem to be developing an oral linguistic system based largely on auditory input from a cochlear implant, which is truly remarkable. It should be stressed, though, that these children that are successful are acquiring their language skills in an extremely supportive environment in which they continue to use sign language and they continue to use other visual cues. And this is really important. If you simply implant the child and sit them in the corner, they're not going to learn language. You have to do a lot of work because to recognize that Dali image is hard. It's really hard. And so it's not just a matter of the technology, it's the support that can make this work. So now, there's only 10 or 20 electrodes in a cochlear implant, and this means that the ability to recognize pitch, high frequencies and low frequencies, is there, but it's not as good as in natural hearing. And because of that, it makes it relatively difficult to recognize music. And so I'd like to play for you a piece of music. And this piece of music is a very well-known piece of music, and it has a very distinctive tempo, so you might recognize it, but the first time I play it to you, I'll play it to you as it sounds through a cochlear implant. Tell me if you know what this is.
Wasn't that nice? <laughs> right, so, so what was that? Anyone want to guess? Okay, so. Uh, <laughs> yeah, right, <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. So let, let me play it again, and this time the original. And I should tell you before I play it that these two sound exactly the same to me, but to you they're going to sound very different. Here we go. Right. So you've all heard that before, right? Great. So, so there's a dramatic difference. But again, just like with the demonstration of voice, you shouldn't think that the horrible mechanical grinding sounds you heard the first time are the sounds that I hear when I listen to music. As long as I know what the piece of music is ahead of time, and I've heard it when I could hear, I can use musical memory to bring it all back. And so my musical tastes are actually frozen in 1989, <laughs> and, the, and the day I lost my hearing. So some people tell me I haven't missed anything. Yeah. <laughs> but actually, I don't believe that for one minute, because I've very much liked music that was very current and popular back in 1989. And I'd love to hear the modern music and what it sounds like, but anyway. So, you can enjoy music with a cochlear implant, but it's limited. You know, jazz sounds really good, something fairly atonal, good rhythm and things like that sound good, but it's a challenge. And so, the cochlear implant is great, but we could improve it. And there's a lot of work going on to improve it. So, in the last couple of minutes, I'll just tell you a couple of things about ways to improve a cochlear implant. So, one of them, a very basic one, is to combine a cochlear implant with a hearing aid. So, as we age, we lose hearing. And it turns out that most people, as they age, lose their high-frequency hearing most, and their lower-frequency hearing remains at some, to some extent. And so the low-frequency hearing can be maintained with a hearing aid. And then we can also put a cochlear implant in to just to the base of the cochlea with a short electrode to stimulate the high frequencies. And you can run both at once. And so now if you do that, the following happens. The graph on the right shows you perception and comprehension when you only have the hearing aid on, and this person could understand nothing with just the hearing aid. With just the cochlear implant, they could understand 51% of what was said to them. But with both, they could understand 84%. So that's the most simple way that you can improve uh, the cochlear implant, is combine it with a hearing aid. And that would work for people that have lost some of the uh, high frequencies. The second way is to have two cochlear implants rather than one. And the reason for that is related to where sound comes from. So how do we know where a sound comes from? So in this cartoon, sound is coming from a loudspeaker, and it's closer to our left ear than our right ear, which means that the sound arrives at our left ear before our right ear. And then it passes through both cochlea onto de um, delay lines of variable lengths. And these two sets of delay lines from each ear meet at a place called the medial superior olive, because it's the size of an olive. And where those delay lines meet, they meet at common neurons. And when a signal arrives at a common neuron in coincidence, and in this cartoon, it's at neuron E, that neuron fires, and none of A, B, C, and D fire. And now, if you move the loudspeaker slightly to the right, the time of arrival at the left ear and right ear changes relatively. And so a different common neuron fires, D. And in this way, humans can tell the direction of a sound to one degree in the plane of their ears. But now imagine that you only have a single cochlear implant, and this won't work, because I have input going in from one side and nothing from the other side. And that means I can't tell direction. And that can be dangerous. If a truck's coming or something, that's a problem. Now, on the graph at the top, there are seven people, and they each had a cochlear implant. In fact, they had two. They were very lucky. They had two cochlear implants. And you can see three shaded rectangles for each of these seven patients. The two rectangles on the left in each case are when you turn off either the left cochlear implant or the right cochlear implant, and then you then say to the person, was the sound on your left or was the sound on your right? And they get it right half the time. In other words, they're guessing. They can't tell. But when you turn on both cochlear implants, that's the higher rectangle on the right in each case, you can see that they do much better. And so the first advantage of having two implants is you can tell where a sound comes from. 
The second advantage is that we live in a very noisy environment. And in noisy environments, it's very difficult even for hearing people to understand sometimes. And so in this example, speech is coming from the front. And in the first case, noise is on the left. And that blue circle there represents a person wearing a cochlear implant on the same ear that the noise is coming in from. And their ability to understand is quite modest. But if the speech is coming from the front, the noise is from the right and the implant is on the left, then the head blocks some of the noise and the sound can come in from the left and you can understand much better at about 70%. But if you have two cochlear implants, it doesn't matter where the noise is. At least one of them will be hearing the sound clearly and you'll get 100% comprehension similar to a hearing person of the same test. And there's a third benefit. Sometimes when a person receives a cochlear implant, they do not do very well. But when the second ear is implanted, they do dramatically better. So that's two ways to improve cochlear implants. There are other ways too. Increasing the number of electrodes and trying to spread them out as much as possible along with 35 millimeter helical length is important because in that way you can present finer spectral information to the auditory nerve and that will lead to improved speech performance and improved music appreciation and that's one area of research. Another area of research is reducing the amount of power that the device uses because if the amount of power is less we could put the whole device inside our head instead of have the batteries outside. And that would be very convenient. I mean at the moment if I want to go swimming I have to take this off. If, I, if it starts to rain, I have to take this off. But if it was all inside, I wouldn't have to. So that would be a, a big improvement. And then another thing is that the, even if the cochlear implant is working really well and producing a lot of electricity, it may well be that the auditory nerve is not in very good condition. In which case, the brain will not see the electricity that you've produced because the auditory nerve has died back, has atrophied, and doesn't convey that electricity to the brain. And under those circumstances, what can be done is regenerate the neurons, the auditory nerve neurons. And a lot of research is going on that to try to restore hearing that way combined with a cochlear implant. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Is there research being done now to augment the, or replace the auditory nerve on somebody who does not have an auditory nerve? Well, um, to replace the entire auditory nerve would be very extreme, but you could do an auditory brain in. Uh, an, auditory brain implant. So this would be where you implant at the brain stem itself. You could do that. But another thing that's being done is to try to get the auditory... Normally what happens is that you have the auditory nerve in most patients and when the cochlear implant doesn't help it's because the auditory nerve has atrophied and died back. So now the electrodes are in the cochlear and the auditory nerve is maybe many millimetres away from where it used to be. So some work is going on to build scaffolds that are full of neurotrophic growth factors that can cause the auditory nerve to grow, rather like peas grow on poles. And so they can grow back towards where they should be, so that it's closer to the electrodes, so the electric fields the electrodes produce can be seen by the auditory nerve. So that kind of work is going on, and they've been able to get auditory nerves to grow considerable distances in mice, for example. If the auditory nerve is then severed, is Well, if the auditory nerve is severed, that's a big problem. And to get it to regrow is very hard. And that hasn't been done in a human. But it's been done in mice. So yeah, that's an area of research. And it's an important area of research. But you can also bypass that auditory nerve and go further in. But the trouble is then the, the surgery becomes much more complex. In the central nervous system, it would be a major issue. It's very different to a cochlear implant. And they're very primitive, the devices, uh, auditory brainstem implants, they're called. They're very primitive at the moment. So in summary, implants enable the post deaf to hear. And they've provided sufficient information to support language development in children, which is a truly remarkable result. And not in all children, in some. Implants have also been a probe of how we recognize speech, whether we're hearing or not. Because we now know that to get good speech recognition, whether it's computer-aided voice recognition of speech, or whether it's how we understand it ourselves, you have to get the frequencies correct. You have to be able to relay to the brain the low frequencies faithfully and the high frequencies faithfully, and not mix them.
And if you do that, that's where the most of the information in, in our language is contained. And getting that right means you can understand speech. The third thing is that for music and speech quality, and for example, recognising accents and male and female voices, that requires a level of fidelity in the perception of pitch that the current cochlear implants don't provide. So it's very difficult to recognise an accent or whether a voice is male or female. But implants are the first prosthesis to successfully re restore a neural function. And so for that reason, they're a benchmark of biomedical engineering. So some final thoughts from me are that a cochlear implant, it seems to me, is a really wonderful example of the power of interdisciplinary science, engineering, and technology. All of these different f fields come together in a tiny package in a human being to improve the human condition. And that's one of the great reasons to do science. There are about 220,000 people with a cochlear implant now in the world. And with the latest devices, three quarters of the post-lingually deaf adults that receive them can use a telephone. And in the case of small children, in some cases, they can hear their parents' voices and learn to understand them, to hear their parents say, I love you, and to understand that. And that's a very precious thing. But it is absolutely important that we work to make this technology more widely known and available to all that might benefit from it, because most of the people in the world that could benefit from it do not have a cochlear implant. At a personal level, 11 years ago, I had my hearing restored after being deaf for 12 years, and it enabled me immediately to more easily do my work, my research, and my teaching, and to hear my wife's voice for the first time in 12 years, and my daughter's voice for the first time ever. So thank you very much.